D&D is made up of mostly encounters. I mean, sure, there's role-playing, narration, arguing, and talking about everyone's weekend, but it's mostly encounters. Social encounters, exploration encounters, and yes, combat encounters. So how do these pro DMs run them in their games? Let's start with Matthew Mercer, whose advice to make encounters more vivid and easier to understand for the players is to remind them to ask questions. Like, literally. Ask them next time you describe an environment, NPC, or a combat scenario, do you want to know anything more? It's a to and fro, whatever kind of encounter it is. The players should be encouraged to constantly ask questions. Whatever the description the DM gives, whatever is shown on a battle map, there's always other stuff in the scene, and stuff the DM may not have even considered or prepped for. How is this space lit? Are there torches on the wall? A chandelier on the ceiling? This probably won't get spoken about in every single room the players enter, but open flames and things the players can swing on? Huge. Great information. How crowded is the room? How loud? Is there anyone with coin purses hanging in precarious positions? Encourage your players to ask questions about things that they want to do. Because obviously you'll find out exactly what they want to do and then can facilitate that the best you can. But it means they don't have to rely on your as the DM's exposition. Nor do you need to talk for 10 minutes straight about every room they go into of every little detail. Also, going off that, I learned something pretty huge from the dungeon dudes when letting players ask questions like that. And that is that a, a player versus DM mentality can sometimes lead to players asking really cryptic questions so that they can kind of trick the DM in letting them do what they want to do and they get to surprise the whole table when it happens. For example, going back to the whole chandelier thing, let's say a player wants to shoot a chandelier with an arrow and then it falls on some enemies. Really cool idea. But rather than just saying that's what they want to do. They instead ask, how is the room lit? Well, there's some torches and some other light sources. And they ask, oh, is one of the light sources a chandelier? And the DM's like, sure. And then the player's like, how does the chandelier look? Is it old? Does it look like it would fall easily? Would it look like it would do damage if it fell? Does it look like anyone is stood under it right now? And the DM's like, yes to all those questions. And then the player's like, I fire an arrow at it. This kind of discourse stems from a player really wanting to surprise the table and also thinking that the DM's not necessarily going to let them do what they want to do because there's some kind of rivalry there, maybe? There's probably a few reasons for this kind of thought process. But really, it's just the players drip-feeding questions to slowly move the scene into a direction that they want. And it can add tens of seconds, if not minutes, to any encounter. So as I learned from the Dungeon Dudes, now if a player starts asking cryptic questions like that, like, how is this room lit? I just ask, what's your intention? And then they say, oh, I want to try and shoot a chandelier onto someone's head. And I say, well, there's a, there's a chandelier now. And there's three enemies stood underneath it. Wow, what are the chances? Roll to hit it. This has made every encounter so much faster and allowed the players to do exactly what they want to do. But it does need the players to be honest and it does need the DM to be adaptable because sometimes the players want to do something with an object that you never even thought in a million years would be in the room. But there is a way you could place one there and heighten the fun for everyone. Also, this video is sponsored by Describe, a library of searchable descriptions sounds and interactive maps to enhance your TTRPG games. Super useful when you're prepping your games and improvising in the moment. And they have a new web app called Opus, giving you over 3,500 sound options available that can be easily streamed to a browser link or through Discord for online play. It's taken my D&D campaigns to the next level and you can try it out for free for 30 days by using the code BONUSACTION. It's all in the description, so check it out and thanks, Describe. Now, we've talked about describing the encounters so the players understand it best. Now let's talk about running them. So we said encounters can be social exploration or combat. And normally for social encounters and exploration encounters like puzzles, you just use theater of the mind, playing out everything in your head, your imagination. But I actually want to normalize using battle maps and minis for more puzzles as well. I've also in the past used minis for social encounters where I have a tavern play mat with groups of NPCs dotted on them as minis and players get to move their minis around and interact with those NPCs and if combat breaks out guess what the battle mat's already set up ready to go it also allows my players to visualize the room way better where everyone is and means that they don't forget about any groups of NPCs or or important NPCs that may be in the room so most of the following advice is geared towards combat encounters but a lot of it you can definitely use for other types too Matt Mercer when planning for combat encounters thinks specifically about what enemies there are what kind of terrain what kind of challenges he can put on the map for the players to like deal with so it's not just 
a, a slog fest, like do as much damage as you can. He thinks about what the enemies can use in the environment, and of course what the players can use. And he also tries to throw some random things in there, just to see what the players might do with them, if anything. And this is great advice for social and exploration encounters too. But instead think about what NPCs or creatures are in the area. What's the terrain? Are they in a jungle or are they in a potion shop? What challenges will they face? Are there traps in the jungle? In the potion shop, are the prices ridiculously high and need to be bartered down? Put things in the jungle or the potion shop that both the NPCs and the players can use to help them reach their goals. And of course, throw some random things in there just to see what the players do with them. And honestly, when researching this video, this was the biggest takeaway for me and something I've not been doing but will be doing from now on. Throwing random things in there, like truly random things, it's such a good idea because you have no idea how these things are gonna get used or even if they can get used but it can lead to truly unpredictable creative problem solving from the players and can lead to the craziest things happening. Next time you have an encounter throw some support beams in the room or some random potion bottles that they don't know what they do on some shelves or a chained up wolf in the corner of the room and then just see what happens. On my Patreon, I'm gonna create a random number table of environmental random factors that you can just roll on next time you want to fill an encounter up with random things, just to see what happens. And interestingly enough, while we're talking about it, when it comes to Theatre of the Mind versus battle maps, specifically for combat, Matt Mercer actually thinks Theatre of the Mind is better for smaller groups. When players don't have something that they all need to focus on and concentrate on the table in front of them, they end up making decisions quicker and describing them in more cinematic ways. But as you get more players, like five and upwards, maybe even four and upwards, theatre of the mind can start to become harder to visualise and understand exactly what the scene looks like. There's simply too many moving parts and there's kind of a bigger gap between player turns for people to get distracted. And that's when a, a battle map with physical minis becomes way more useful. Matt's also just a big fan of miniatures. He's been collecting them for a very long time. So really, it is just a preference for the DM. There's no right way to run D&D encounters. When it comes to minis or just using your imagination, just do whatever you feel like doing in the moment, as long as your players can still have fun and keep track of everything going on. Brennan Lee Mulligan also prefers using maps where he can, but suggests double checking with your group before you decide to go the way of Theatre of the Mind over Battle Map, because there's actually some classes and playstyles that suffer from just using your imagination. Any class that uses a lot of area of effect moves, or certain martial classes that get benefit from enemies being in certain positions, or allies being in certain positions in relation to you. It's way better for these people to be on a battle map. Lightning Bolt is one of my favourite spells because you can hit multiple people if they're stood in a line and that's really hard to guarantee using Theatre of the Mind because I bet if you ask most DMs using Theatre of the Mind and visualising all this stuff in their heads, are these guards stood directly in a line to each other? They're going to be like, no, that would be, be pretty ridiculous if they were all just lined up for you. But you'd be surprised at how often that actually just happens on a battle map. You'll just end up with like four or five enemies in a line if you maneuver yourself correctly. But if your players don't care too much about that stuff, mechanical, technical things, then all good. Use Theatre of the Mind if you want. Combat will be faster and more cinematic. Also, you don't need expensive terrain and minis and battle maps to do this. Both Matt and Brennan are fans of using just paper or dry erase boards and tokens, bottle caps or Othello pieces. I love using these kind of books. Each page is a different battle mat and you can dry erase draw on them no issue or even just put terrain over the top. I'll link them in the description below. Honestly they're a game changer. Abri Iyengar in episode 7 of Exandria Unlimited has this amazing encounter setup. Spoiler alert by the way but the way she runs this encounter is really interesting to me. Pretty much there's this weird cube floating in the middle of the scene. It has its own gravity so if you get too close you get pulled into it and can stand on it and walk on it and it has images and messages all over it that the players can roll to see if they can understand what it says. This is a puzzle encounter in its simplest form. The what is it puzzle. But the thing I love most about this puzzle, and what I'm taking away to use in my own future puzzles, is that it's a multi-tier approach. Fundamentally, for this puzzle, the players need to figure out A, if the cube's dangerous or not, B, they need to figure out how to get on top of the cube safely, and once on the cube, they need to do a skill check to see if they can read the messaging on 
each side of the cube, so that's six skill checks. Then there's also a hidden creature in the mix, a threat waiting to attack them if they trigger certain things, including rolling really badly or taking too long. Once they translate each side of the cube, the puzzle solved. It's not just a straight, oh, a puzzle, uh, I, I roll to see if I, I do it, and then they succeed or they don't. It's also not a riddle that the players can kind of figure out outside of their characters at the table as players with our worldly knowledge. It's a set piece where the players need to navigate the area using their abilities and skill checks, and it has a threat of a monster attack, and it inspired me to make an acronym for how I'm going to prepare for encounters in the future. UNAT, understand, navigate, advance, threat. When creating an encounter, especially the exploration and puzzle type, I'm going to start by having my players roll to see if they can get a clearer picture of exactly what is going on. Perceptions, investigations, history, arcana, these are all great options for something like this, and it's all to help them understand what is going on. Then have them move through the space, place obstacles and dangerous terrain around, so that the main parts of this encounter aren't that easy to reach. This way the players can use their own character's abilities to aid them and each other in navigating the space. Then have them try to actually do the puzzle, have them roll to see if they succeed, whatever it may be. Give them the ability to advance, and if they fail, have a threat that gets closer, whether it be falling terrain, or a monster, or just something that damages the characters. Unat. Okay, I, I didn't spend that long on this one, I, I might change it in the future. But it means that the players get to feel like they're, they're constantly rolling checks and using their character builds to, to get around the space and aid them in this puzzle. It also means that there's consequences to bad rolls, and it also gives the players a chance to properly assess the situation and roleplay figuring out the best approach, rather than them just ending up in the middle of a super dangerous encounter. Though I do find it incredibly useful to often remind my players that a bad decision is a good decision in D&D. So if they ever feel uncertain, just act, which means they don't get analysis paralysis as much in situations like this. I should also say here that while Abria throws skill checks out non-stop for this, like the whole encounter, she never lets mechanics get in the way of pacing. She will rule of cool things to keep the flow of the game flowing and not get bogged down in arguably pointless nitpicks. For example, how she says stop it when Ashley tries to get technical, figuring out how far she can actually move with an ability of hers. Um, let me see how far the mirthful leap is. Oh, stop it. Do okay. you want to do a high one or a low one? Why is it not a kid? We are not letting mechanics get in the way of you going on the high side of this cube. Mm -hmm. And honestly, this is understandable. Just because the group was rolling so badly on all of their rolls this entire encounter. So it did kind of feel like she was just giving them a win here. So I guess the tip here is don't be afraid to keep morale up when your players are rolling badly. Just by giving them little wins and letting them do cool stuff. And if some slightly different numbers on a page mean that they can't do a really cool thing, maybe just let them do it without looking up how far they can actually jump. It's entirely within your power as a DM. Brennan Lee Mulligan suggests not using CR, challenge rating, too much when prepping for combat encounters. They can be good to give you a loose idea of how difficult a challenge is going to be, but there's so much more to consider when it comes to balancing these encounters. Since the number of players at your table can drastically change how hard this combat's going to be, as well as how many resources your player characters currently have, what kind of magic weapons you've given them, whether they've had a long rest recently or if they've been a bunch of fights just now, what the train's like, what the environment is like, what the composition of the party is like, like is there a healer? And this does go to social and exploration encounters too. If you have a player who's amazing at detecting and disarming traps, then exploration encounters probably going to be pretty easy for your group compared to if they didn't have that person. If you don't have a rogue on your team at all, then there's a good chance, well, let's face it, great chance that your players are going to get stuck on a plain wooden door. So if you want to make truly challenging and fun encounters, you simply need to know your players' characters well. I always get my player characters' sheets up when I'm prepping, just to refresh my memory of what everyone can do, and I can balance encounters specifically for them. That being said, Renan has also said that sometimes it's good to make encounters easy. Let the players mop the floor with some bad guys. Let them stealth through a dangerous area easily. Let them take full advantage of an NPC while haggling prices down at a shop. Often players want to roleplay being an absolute 
boss as much as they want to challenge. So sometimes throw them a bone. Let them beat the absolute living life out of some monsters. Venom also goes out of his way here to make sure that people understand that he personally doesn't really do this in his actual players that you may see. He never throws out just easy combat simply because it's not that fun for an audience to watch. But rest assured it is fun for players at home to take part in. Though as with all things, keep things balanced. And now this is a reminder for editor me later, so don't put this in the edit Phil, but do put in a clip of Thanos saying perfectly balanced as all things should be. Also, uh, just a reminder, future Phil, pick up some milk. Since the one in the fridge says that the sell-by date is tomorrow, but I don't know, I, I just, I don't trust it. Also, a reminder for the audience to subscribe and to watch another video of mine. Um, thank you for watching.